This is Sam of Historian Explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures are on SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, and other platforms. And if you can help to keep them coming, please go to my Patreon page. The link is in the description. So in anticipation of an interview that I expect to do soon with a historian of modern Britain who has studied the honor system, the system of knighthoods and damehoods and so forth, and the monarchy and the role it's played in modern British society. I want to go back and pick up the thread that I left off previously last year about English dynastic history, the history of the different monarchs of Britain, what they reflect and what impact they've had on British society. And specifically, it happens to be really appropriate that I'm going to talk this time now about James II, because we just saw recently, earlier this year, the accession to the throne of a new king who is a mature man, a man who's had many years behind him, a complex life and career with a lot of ups and downs and vicissitudes and scandals. And in a lot of ways, he is, you can see as a kind of echo of James II, who came to the throne back in 1685, although we are yet to see whether this new king's reign will be anywhere near as disastrous as was James II's. Perhaps the lately departed prime minister who just left after the shortest term in office ever in British history in some ways is a bit more resonant with what ended up happening with James II. But before we get into that, I left off a previous lecture called England Interrupted by talking about the end of the reign of Charles II, who died in February 1685. And this ended, most scholars would say, ended the Restoration Era, this time of an uneasy peace among the different factions of English society. So the Restoration had seen a kind of careful but possibly fragile balance of power between the monarchy and parliament, between Protestants and Catholics, and especially between Whigs and Tories, these new partisan factions that had formed within Parliament. And I'll talk later about why these divisions were so deep in the late 1600s and what they represented. But nonetheless, these divides that had been lingering in Restoration England were reactivated after Charles was succeeded then by his younger brother, James, the Duke of York. And he was a very complex character. We'll talk about what sort of person he was and what his life had been like. But first and foremost, he was a Catholic. And this was very important because he was the first Catholic ruler to come to the English throne since Mary Tudor, more than 100 years earlier, unless you count Charles II for maybe a few minutes on his deathbed when he converted to Catholicism in his last moments. But excluding that, this was a dramatic new development to now have a new monarch coming to the throne who is a Catholic ruling over a now firmly Protestant majority country. But before we get into his religion, we have to consider where was he coming from? Who was he? What happened to him before he became king? And how then did that help to lead to another radical rupture and to what has been called a revolution that paved the way for a new constitutional settlement and even more than that paved the way for a modern commercial imperial Britain, more like the Britain we think of today. So to go back, who was James and what was his life like before he became king? Well, he was born in 1633 as the second son of King Charles I and his Roman Catholic wife, Henrietta Maria. So, you know, there's often the saying, the, the monarch and their spouse have to come up with an heir and a spare. And Charles and Henrietta Maria did, and it happens James was the spare. So for most of his life, it didn't seem too likely that he would become king. He was sort of waiting in the wings. He was raised and educated mainly by tutors in the royal palace, and he was showered with extravagant titles, including Duke of York, which already by that time was a traditional title for the younger sons of the king, and also Lord High Admiral, even when he was just a young child. 
He then came of age in his early teenage years. He came of age in the midst of the constitutional crisis and the civil war, in which Parliament rose up in revolt against his father, Charles I, and eventually overthrew and executed him. As a teenager, James actually fought in one battle of the Civil War, and apparently was fairly competent, at least for his young age, and he barely escaped from being taken prisoner by the parliamentarians. At the end of the war, he was held captive for a time by the parliamentary government in London, but he was able to escape abroad and go to France, where he joined his elder brother Charles in exile. While in exile, he became an adult and he served for a time in the French army, fighting against the Fronde Rebellion and also against the Spanish. And he was noted for his courage and aggressiveness in battle, and he was promoted to the rank of lieutenant general, partly based on his performance. But then he was expelled from France due to a diplomatic realignment, when France eventually made an alliance with the Commonwealth government under Cromwell. So very abruptly, he was forced to leave France, and he had to switch sides to Spain and fought for a time in the service of Spain. A few years later, however, in 1660, the English Parliament reversed course and invited Charles to come back and retake the throne in England, and he was proclaimed King Charles II. And James naturally was able to return with him. So he went back to England, and he soon took up actual duties as Lord High Admiral. He reclaimed that title and actually took up command of the Navy. He was also made governor of the slave trading cartel called the Royal African Company. And so he had, maybe you could say, split loyalties. And in the Anglo-Dutch War in the 1660s, he commanded the English Navy, and he focused on capturing trading ports in Africa as a way of furthering the the interests of the Royal African Company. James also was given further special duties and tasks. He was granted charters to govern the colony of New Netherlands in America after it was captured from the Dutch, and hence he uh, took an interest in this colony. It was renamed New York in his honor because he was Duke of York. And it seems he began to use New York as a sort of laboratory for the policy of religious toleration. And for several decades, New York was the most religiously free and tolerant colony in North America. He also oversaw firefighting operations during the Great Fire in 1666 and was perceived to be brave and effective and gained some degree of public favor. So by the end of 1666, he seemed to be pretty promising, right? His brother, King Charles, still had no children. Although he was young and perfectly capable of fathering children, he still didn't conceive any with his wife. So James, by most accounts, seemed to be pretty solid and well-liked and a pretty good prospect for a possible future king if his brother had no children. But soon his popularity would come under strain, and this stemmed largely from his family life. So early on in 1660, shortly after returning to England, James married Anne Hyde, who was the daughter of a government minister, and she was a commoner, not a noblewoman, and much less a foreign princess. So this was seen as an inappropriate marriage. The king had forbidden it, but nonetheless, James followed through and married Anne Hyde in secret, and it seems to have been a close and affectionate marriage. Anne and James had a total of seven children through the course of the 1660s, but most of them died in infancy or childhood, which was common. Only two lived to adulthood, and those were two daughters named Mary and Anne, and they were both raised as Protestants. So at this time, the whole royal family and Anne Hyde are all firm down the line Anglican Protestants. It seems that James very much loved and was affectionate towards his wife Anne and his two daughters and spent a lot of quality time with them. And his wife, it seems, was a major influence on James's views and loyalties. So it was very significant when Anne then converted in 1667 to Roman Catholicism. And sometime not long after that, James, it seems, followed Anne's lead. We don't know the exact details, but it is evident that he began to take Catholic communion 
1668 or 69 and gradually stopped going to Anglican church services. This was still a private matter. It took place at private masses held within the court, right? Because Catholic worship was still technically illegal, but there were sort of special dispensations allowing Catholic masses to be held within the court. So James's Catholic loyalties were still a private matter and a subject of rumors and whispers around court and sometimes beyond. And it makes sense to some degree also that James converted because his mother, Henrietta Maria, had been a Catholic, and he had spent so many years abroad in the service of both France and Spain. So he probably was already familiar and favorably disposed to the Catholic religion. His wife Anne died in 1671, and it seems as if this probably further sealed and cemented his resolution to remain Catholic. Now, all of this might have remained below board and just a sort of private, non-political matter until Parliament enacted a Test Act. So there was a growing fear of Catholic influence or infiltration in England, especially among the House of Commons. And they passed this Test Act, which required that anyone in any sort of public office had to take an oath in which they condemned various Catholic doctrines, including transubstantiation. It seems that particularly bothered them. And they had to pledge to take Anglican communion in the Church of England. And this test act actually applied to James because he was the Lord High Admiral of the Navy. And he refused to take this oath and instead resigned from his office. And hence his Catholic loyalties became obvious and publicly known. And it happened that he was not alone. He was joined by hundreds of royal and local officials, all of whom resigned in a wave rather than submit to this test act which surprised and even alarmed a number of people around the country to see that there were so many private Catholics all over England and even in high offices. But James, Duke of York, was especially important because of his closeness to the king and because of the fact that he was still the heir apparent and likely successor of his brother. So this incident, when James resigned in 1673 led to a tug of war over the religious future of the dynasty. And this was especially pressing because King Charles still had no legitimate children. He was perfectly productive of illegitimate children with his many mistresses of all backgrounds and faiths. But for whatever reason, his wife Catherine of Braganza still had not had any children. So James was next in line to the throne, followed then by his daughters, the elder daughter Mary, and then Anne. So the king's faith and those of his heirs were very serious political matters. And Charles had to work out a sort of bargain, where firstly he allowed James to get remarried a few years later to an Italian Catholic princess named Mary of Modena. But in exchange, James agreed that his elder daughter Mary, who was a Protestant like the king, would be matched to William of Orange, the head of state of the Dutch Republic. And this was extremely significant. Mary, it seems, didn't like the idea, was sort of coerced into it, but politically and diplomatically, it made sense for the country. So William of Orange was a committed Protestant. He was technically the Stadtholder of the Dutch Republic, which is sort of like state caretaker. But really, by this time, by the late 1600s, it had become basically like a monarchy. And William was the, the heir, the scion of the House of Orange, which had become basically like the dynastic ruling house of the Netherlands. So he was really king in all but name of the Netherlands. And he was a Protestant hero, and he was the main sort of Protestant nemesis of the big Catholic rival, which was France. And so from the Protestant point of view, he made for a natural ally to England. If he married Mary, that would ensure a Protestant succession, a Protestant dynasty from Mary and her progeny onwards, because James still didn't have any sons, right? So Mary was still his heir. And it represented the promise of a future alliance of England and the Netherlands, a reorientation away from 
friendly relations with France, which had been the rule in the Restoration era, and more towards the Protestant world. And it also implied that William would really become the actual de facto ruler of England. And that's partly because William now would not only be married to to Mary, the second in line to the throne, but also because he himself was related to the English ruling dynasty as well. His mother, his father had been William II, the Stadtholder of, of the Netherlands, and his mother had been an English princess, the sister of Charles II and James. So for those keeping score, yes, that does mean that William was a nephew of Charles and of James, and hence he was the first cousin of Princess Mary. This was a, a marriage of first cousins. But, you know, what's a little incest between royals, right? This is how the game is played. And it did matter that he was related, that through his maternal line, to Charles and James, because that further reinforced William's link to England and his credibility as a possible future regent, the real de facto ruler, or maybe even as a future king. Maybe he could finagle the title of king if he got the right support and allies within England. So this marriage of Mary and William of Orange ought to then have allayed the fears of many English Protestants. But nonetheless, anxiety did remain. There, it was still a fact that James was the successor, the next successor to the throne before Mary or William. And this anxiety and fear then broke out again into paranoia and panic in the years 1678 to 81 in the furor over the supposed popish plot, which I discussed more last time in, in my previous lecture on England Interrupted. James himself, during this outbreak of conspiratorial fear around the Popish plot, James tried to be accommodating. He supported calls for a full investigation into the allegations. And there were multiple ongoing trials of many accused Catholic conspirators. And these were mainly overseen by James's own attorney, George Jeffries, who was known for being extremely harsh, for taunting and ridiculing the defendants and, and accused uh, conspirators, and for the harshness of his punishments. He meted out many executions and forms of torture. And Jeffries, in this way, he was, he was a staunch Protestant, but he nonetheless personally trusted James. There was a sort of special alliance between them. And Jeffries argued against the exclusion bill, in Parliament, which sought to exclude James from the line of succession. Jeffreys really believed in the sanctity of the law and of royal authority, and in James's good character. And he came to be closely trusted both by James and by King Charles, and a few years later he was appointed as Lord Chief Justice. Nonetheless, in the height of this furor over the Popish plot, James was forced to temporarily leave England, and went first to Belgium for a time, and then when it seemed safe, went to Scotland, took up residence at Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh. But finally, in 1681 to 82, the furor over the Popish plot gradually died down, and the idea of excluding James from the succession was dropped, and he was able then to return to England from, from Edinburgh back to London. But just then, just bef before he had really even taken up full residence back in London, in May 1682, he was sailing aboard a warship, the Gloucester, as it journeyed down the east coast of England, when it violently struck a sandbank and sank within an hour. And in this disastrous shipwreck, about 200 people drowned, and James himself narrowly escaped and got to shore. And Stuart Royal propagandists presented his survival as miraculous, a sign of divine favor. But just then, following on the heels of this close call, in 1683, the Rye House plot was discovered, which was a very sophisticated insurrectionary plot led by a group of aristocrats headquartered at a manor house in Hertfordshire called Rye House. And the plan was to assassinate both King Charles and James, to overthrow the monarchy, and to declare a new republic on the model of the parliamentarian commonwealth. 
One of the likely conspirators in this plot was King Charles' illegitimate son, the Duke of Monmouth, who then fled abroad. And this scandal around the Rye House plot actually ended up helping to boost James's popularity again, right? Which was just in time, because shortly after, in February 1685, Charles II finally died, and James was proclaimed king, coming to the throne at the relatively advanced age of 52. So what was the situation when James did finally come to the throne? Well, one thing we have to consider is James's personal attitude and outlook. He was older than most monarchs are when they come to the throne. He was very set in his ways and firm in his convictions. Many would say stubborn. He was a devout Catholic, not only committed to that faith, but really with the zeal of the convert, someone who had embraced the religion as an adult. He was very confident in his divine right as a king. A lot of this was probably influenced by his experience in France, where, which was really the homeland of Catholic divine right absolutism. And he had survived, as we saw, repeated close brushes with death. And I think this almost certainly had an influence on him as well. He had been repeatedly threatened or forced into exile by one enemy or another before finally making his way to the throne. And he came to the throne, it seems, with a sense of distrust, probably resentment towards his critics and his enemies. And also, I think, a sense of destiny, the notion that his accession to the throne after surviving so many dangers and obstacles was providential. Right, that he was coming to the throne finally and as a faithful Catholic. Now, what about everyone else? What was the political lay of the land among the people of England when he becomes king? Well, as I said, there was this deep divide between Catholics and Protestants. And this was not just a matter of doctrine, right? Certainly people fought over things like transubstantiation, but it also was political and social. Each religion was seen as not just a, a variety of Christianity, but as aligning with a totally different vision of society. So if we think of the most committed Protestants, these are usually concentrated in the larger towns and in London, and politically they support the Whig party. The Whig party was the party that had wanted to exclude James from the succession when he comes to the throne, are his most likely enemies. And the Whigs associate Protestantism with liberty, in quotation marks, which doesn't just mean personal freedom. It meant for them participatory government, as embodied by town councils and corporations, and especially by parliament. And Whigs drew on classical republicanism, the idea of a commonwealth of independent, self-supporting men. And they even used that word, commonwealth. They claimed to defend England's, quote, religion, liberty, and property. And in terms of their class profile, the Whig faction is rooted in merchants and new landholders, those who held property in fee simple, over which they had exclusive rights to dispose of it however they wished. And they had gained these properties through the dissolution of the monasteries in the 1500s and the enclosure movement in which land dealers, buyers, speculators had seized what had been common lands, closed it off, and sold it to buyers and speculators. And they wanted to defend their holdings of land without duties to honor the rights of tenants or the, the rights to the common lands. They tended to associate Catholicism with tyranny and slavery. And famously, the poet Andrew Marvell, who was also a member of Parliament and a committed Whig, he wrote a pamphlet in 1677 where he warned of the growth of popery in England and along with it, quote, tyranny, slavery, and idolatry. So they see those things as all connected and part of one social system that they want to resist and that they see as embodied by Catholic Europe, especially France. And more practically speaking, the Whigs were also just afraid of losing the political voice that they had in the House of Commons and of losing title to the properties that they had gained over the previous 200 years. Now, at the opposite extreme, you have Catholics. There were 
a number of private so-called Catholic recusants who refused to take part in Anglican worship. It was by this time a small minority, but not insignificant. Maybe about 10 to 12 percent of England was still Catholic. They tended to be in the rural areas and especially the Northwest. Lancashire in the Northwest had the most Catholics. They see themselves as guardians of an old England, an older world where classes and institutions have duties to the wider society. They tend to believe in landlords, masters and employers, and the church who derive their authority from their responsibility for the well-being of commoners. They harbor hopes of reversing the enclosure movement, of returning to older land arrangements, and also of reestablishing monastic houses, which had been a big part of English society before Henry VIII. They tend to associate the Whigs with the grasping, greedy merchant elite, with corrupt government, and with the enclosure movement and the dispossession and widespread poverty that the enclosure movement had led to. So you have these two extremes, right? And clearly the Whigs are bigger, more powerful, have more of a political voice at this moment when James comes to the throne in 1685. But meanwhile, you also have the Tories. And in this context, the Tories could be seen as sort of the mushy middle, right? They were the wide swath of English society, which also tended to be mostly rural, mostly concentrated in the northern and western parts of England. They favor a middle way in religion, a sort of compromise style of worship in the Anglican Church, which is not entirely like Reformed Protestantism and not entirely like Catholicism, but something in between. Socially, they're based in a rural, traditional, agrarian society. They embrace the values of paternalism, social stability, and social cohesion as against what they see as the corrupt, greedy, commercial society of London and the court. But nonetheless, they still also see Catholicism as a danger, as a foreign and idolatrous religion, and they tend to be very strongly committed to the Church of England. And the the Tory party and the Church of England continue to be closely wedded. And in modern times, people sometimes describe the Church of England as, quote, the Tory party at prayer. That was a 19th century suffragist who coined that phrase, and it sort of captures how people see the Church of England. These, this religious position and political position are closely wedded. So when James comes to the throne, he has the support among Catholics, naturally, who see him as a possible defender, uh, an advocate of toleration and acceptance, and he also has pretty firm support among the Tories. And in 1685, the Tories had a majority in Parliament. So there was a favorable majority there inclined to cooperate and work together with James. And it seems very much that there that he has an opportunity to govern and maybe to readjust the course of society in Britain if he plays his cards and manages the situation right. As of May 1685, as I said, the Parliament is mostly Tory. It's fairly friendly. It willingly votes to enable him to levy various taxes and raise money for military and other purposes. But the House of Commons firmly rejects his idea of exempting Catholics from the Test Act. So Whigs and Tories in Parliament still largely want to keep that Test Act in place so that they know the religious loyalties and the the Anglican loyalties of anyone holding high office. If they had approved this exception to the Test Act, it would effectively have made Catholicism another state-sponsored religion alongside the Church of England, and it would have weakened the Church of England's authority, their ability to keep people coming to their church services if they didn't have to for their political and legal standing. So James comes to uh, butt heads with Parliament over this matter of the Test Act and whether or not to exempt Catholics from it. And he then repeatedly suspends Parliament over and over again over the next two years, a lot like his father Charles had done back in the 1630s. Now, 
This might have led to a, a total breakdown, but in a sense you could say he got a bit of a partial reprieve in an odd ironic way, when in May and June 1685, a rebellion broke out against him, and it was led again by Charles's illegitimate son, the Duke of Monmouth, who landed with an invasionary force, right? This is what people keep doing over and over again in Britain, right? They go abroad into exile, they gather up some foreign supporters and mercenaries, they venture across the channel, land somewhere, and hope to rally supporters to their cause. So this is what Monmouth did. He landed with a force in Dorset in the southwest of England. He claimed to be the rightful heir of Charles, which required some rewriting of marital history, and he rallied some supporters to him, especially in the West Country, and it touched off uprisings both in the West Country of England and in Scotland. So James rallied together and commanded an army and militias that confronted Monmouth aggressively and defeated the uprisings. Monmouth tried to escape the country again, but was captured, and the Lord Chief Justice by this time is George Jeffreys, who then summarily executed Monmouth without a trial. So clearly, you know, Monmouth had lost this struggle, but nonetheless, summarily executing him without even allowing a defense was a little controversial, and it raised the question of whether James was maybe overplaying his hand. And this turned out to be just the beginning of a series of escalating events that heightened the tension and eventually the power struggle between James and his opponents in Parliament. So after the Monmouth Rebellion was put down, Lord Chief Justice George Jeffreys oversaw a series of aggressive treason trials in which he meted out punishments, including drawing and quartering, you know, the most sort of graphic, horrific way of executing someone, to participants in the rebellion and even to many who had only harbored rebels after the fact, were not even active participants in the uprising itself. And his court was especially draconian. It came to be called, quote, the Bloody Assizes. And in the course of about two months, they executed 320 people and transported a further 800 to Barbados, which at this time was effectively, effectively enslavement, right? Because there was no clear legal boundary yet between slaves imported from Africa and condemned prisoners from Europe. And also, even beyond that, it was effectively like a form of execution because the harsh work and the disease environment in Barbados was so brutal that most of them just died pretty quickly after arrival. So this really draconian crackdown on the Monmouth Rebellion could be seen as justified, in a sense, and within royal authority because this was how you treated traitors. But nonetheless, the House of Lords saw Jeffreys as going too far and called for his removal. He was seen as overstepping the customary bounds of how to treat subjects, even if they were accused of treason. And in response, James just again suspended Parliament. This just became another point of contention, leading to a cycle of Parliaments being convened and suspended. Then in October 1685, so just later that year, King Louis XIV of France revoked the Edict of Nantes, which was the long-standing royal proclamation that allowed certain limited toleration for Protestants in France. So Louis XIV quickly and aggressively renewed per persecution of French Protestants. Many of them were also tortured and killed. Thousands of them fled to England because England was still a Protestant country. But the whole incident raised fears that Protestantism was losing ground and was now under attack across Europe. And James himself had no control over these events, right? This was all going on in France. But nonetheless, he was an ally to Louis XIV. It was known that he had grown up in large part in France, and it helped to resurface fears that James possibly wanted to do something similar, that he maybe also believed he could forcibly reimpose Catholicism in England and bring similar persecutions across the Channel. Now, meanwhile, across the ocean, in the colonies, the English colonies abroad, James also undertook a program of reform that raised some alarm and consternation as well. So James's government 
revoked the charters of several colonies in North America, including all four of the New England colonies and New York. And all of these colonies had previously had elected assemblies, and some of them had elected their own governors. But James shut all of those charter-based governments down, consolidated them into a single so-called Dominion of New England, which would have a royally appointed governor and council. So he was taking away self-government from these local colonial regimes, which in the case of New England had actually been seen as sort of Protestant strongholds and even ideal societies, right? Godly New England, Massachusetts, Connecticut. And this sent a possible message about James's aims, right? It could be seen as an early example of something that happens over and over again in empires, of reforms being tried out first in the colonies abroad before then being brought home, and especially sort of authoritarian consolidation of power. It might be carried out first in colonies and then brought back to the home country. And it seemed to be an illustration of James looking again to France as a model, right? He was setting up a dominion in North America similar to New France, right, in what's now Canada. And this was very concerning, and it seemed to raise the possibility again of renewed persecution or tyrannical rule, and it reactivated fears of so-called tyranny and popery advancing together. So all of these fears and concerns are looming over the political situation when in the following year, in April 1687, James issued an indulgence declaration. So he invoked his so-called dispensing power, which is sort of like uh, pardoning power, the power to grant exceptions to laws. And he used his dispensing power to suspend the test acts so that civil servants and local office holders no longer had to take an oath of allegiance to the Anglican Church. And one of the effects of this is that it opened the door to government power for English Catholics and also on the other side to Protestant dissenters and nonconformists, these sort of breakaway nonconforming groups like Quakers and Presbyterians. So some people like this. Obviously, Catholics and dissenters saw this as very welcome, but it led to a backlash and opposition from mainstream Anglicans. And they, of course, were in the majority in Parliament. So the House of Commons strenuously objected and argued that the king did not have this authority to totally override laws enacted by Parliament. So what did James do? In July, he finally dissolved Parliament permanently. Right, and forbade them from meeting any further. And this latest conflict then in 1687 led then to a concerted and aggressive royal campaign to create support for his program. So he used his executive power to appoint Catholics to town councils, to judgeships, to militia offices and even army and navy offices. He appointed a Roman Catholic as Chief Justice of Ireland, which was the main sort of instrument of royal authority in Ireland. And he even began getting deep into civil society, interfering in academic elections of dons and, and deans in Oxford and Cambridge. And in pretty short time, Magdalen College at Oxford was secured as a Catholic beachhead with a Catholic faculty and curriculum in Oxford. So he's clearly trying to advance and sort of weave Catholicism deeper and also higher into English civil society. It seems as if he hoped, it, there, there were clear signs that he hoped to not only suspend but repeal the test acts entirely, thus eliminating any requirement of adherence to the Church of England. But he didn't have enough support in Parliament to make that happen. So he then further embarked on a Catholicization plan for the local councils and for Parliament. And he may not have been able, it may have been a bit too ambitious to actually get Roman Catholics into the House of Commons, but he did have the aim of stacking Parliament with allies and supporters, including sympathetic Protestant dissenters, and he required that all candidates who stood for election to parliament had to be approved by their local lord lieutenant, which was a, a royally appointed office for the county or the province. 
And as a condition to get this pre-approval from the Lord Lieutenant, the candidate had to pledge support for repealing the test acts. Right? So he's, he's trying to sort of filter who can get into parliament and ensure that it's only those who support his ultimate legislative goals. And furthermore, local governments, the town councils and corporations, not only did the king put his thumb on the scales, but he even began to fire and purge out Whigs and committed Anglicans and replace them with his allies, including Catholics. Now, in this whole campaign, it was so ambitious and so far-reaching, it's unclear exactly what the king's actual goal was, and this is still debated to this day. Was his idea to make England a tolerant kingdom with freedom of religion, including for his co-religionists, or was his goal to go further and re-Catholicize the country? Was he hoping to reverse the Reformation and make England ultimately back into a Catholic kingdom? It's really unclear. On the one hand, some historians have found statements or reported statements by the king against prejudice in principle and in favor of freedom of conscience and toleration. For instance, in the early 2000s, a Canadian graduate student found a diary in an archive in England that recorded a speech that James II gave in the city of Chester in 1687, in which the king reportedly defended the idea of religious toleration on principle. And it included this passage in the account of the speech. It included the passage, quote, Suppose there should be a law made that all black men should be imprisoned. It would be unreasonable. And we had as little reason to quarrel with other men for being of different opinions as for being of different complexions. End quote. So this passage, you know, some modern scholars have seized upon this as a sort of forerunner of modern ideas of equality and toleration. And it seems to presage modern beliefs in civil equality and in the equivalence of racial prejudice and religious prejudice. But on the other hand, there were actions by James that seem to speak to the something different. For instance, around the same time, James II summoned his Lord of the Treasury, the Earl of Rochester, and demanded that he must convert to Catholicism. He decided it was inappropriate for a Catholic ruler to have a Protestant Lord of the Treasury in such an important office. So he demanded that the Earl convert, and when he refused, he fired him. And this was one sort of high-level instance of an increasing drive to purge out Protestants out of power and out of the king's inner circle. So again, there are different contradictory signs of what exactly James was trying to achieve. There's no doubt that he felt a sense of injustice, that Catholics had been deprived of the opportunity to serve in office, that they had been discriminated against, they had been cast as disloyal to the realm, and he definitely wanted to get Catholics into office partly as a way of demonstrating that they could be loyal servants of the kingdom. But beyond that, it's unclear exactly what he was trying to accomplish. But in the following year, after several months of this Catholicization campaign, in April 1688, James issued an order that his Declaration of Indulgence must be read out in all the churches across the kingdom. And this caused a lot of upset. You know, not only did clergy have to accept this declaration, they had to go through the sort of humiliation of announcing it from their own pulpits. And this led, not surprisingly, to seven bishops refusing to comply with this order and drawing up a petition against it to the king. And this petition of the seven bishops called for maintaining the existing religious policy, including the Test Act, and also arguing further that the king did not have the proper authority to overturn the Test Act. He didn't have the ability to undo a law enacted through Parliament. And King James took this as a serious insult and a challenge. And he replied that his power, his dispensing power, came from God, and he was not going to give it up to anyone. Now, at this time, that was, that was a very loaded way of speaking. And 
in some ways, if you had gone back 100, 200, 300 years, it wouldn't sound so shocking. It was normal for monarchs to claim that they were anointed by God, and that's where they derived their ultimate authority and position from. But by this time, when you had absolutists like Louis XIV in France claiming divine right not only to rule but to absolute power that couldn't be limited by anyone in the kingdom, it came across as more threatening and as carrying more dangerous implications. So the king rejected this petition as as an insult and affront to his majesty. He had the seven bishops imprisoned and charged with treason. Now, these bishops then received a great public outpouring of sympathy. They were seen as martyrs for the Protestant church, and their supporters included a lot of members of parliament, both Whigs and Tories. And a few months later in June, the bishops were acquitted in court anyway of the charge of treason. And this was a humiliation and a slap in the face further to King James, that now the bishops, parliament, and the court system were all defying his orders. All of these things were leading to a greater and greater friction and towards a real constitutional crisis. But even at this point, even by the beginning of June, it may have seemed to many people that it would eventually blow over. And a lot of Protestants, including Whigs, were willing to sort of uh, grit their teeth and simply put up with this situation for as long as it would continue because it wouldn't go on forever, right? James's heirs and successors were all Protestants, and so this was only a temporary situation. They would just put up with and indulge this kind of pig-headed Catholic king for the time being. But the final escalation that really forced this into a dramatic upheaval and a revolutionary break came on June 10th, 1688. And that is when James's wife, Mary of Modena, gave birth to a son, a young infant prince who was named James Francis Edward Stuart. So Mary of Modena had had previous to this a long series of miscarriages and stillbirths. And probably a lot of Protestants were hoping that that would be the end of it and there would be no Catholic heir much less a male Catholic heir. So this was evidently the first healthy baby born to Mary of Modena, and furthermore, it was a boy. And hence, by virtue of his sex, he supplanted both Princess Mary and Princess Anne. In the line of succession, he immediately became the heir presumptive. And this threatened then the possibility of a continuing and indefinite Catholic dynasty. So this forced the religious issue then to a head very suddenly, and the opponents of James and his program saw that they had to act fast. And very quickly, rumors were circulated orally and even in print, alleging that the prince was an imposter, that this birth had actually been just another stillbirth, and that the king and queen in their desperation had a child smuggled in to the queen's bedchamber in a bedwarming pan. So this conspiracy theory took off very quickly. It was appealing. It seemed to avoid. It allowed for denial of the real dynastic situation that the country was now in. James was outraged and collected and printed the testimonies of midwives and various other witnesses to attest that the birth was genuine and the prince was legitimate. But nonetheless, Whig politicians latched on to these false rumors and conspiracy theories in order to legitimize the young prince and in order to force a conflict between King James and his male heir apparent, his Protestant male heir heir apparent, William of Orange. And a Whig group opened up communication with William of Orange in the Netherlands and urged him to demand a public inquiry into the true birth and parentage of the prince. So this situation is what then led to a revolution. So the parliamentary leaders communicated with William and successfully persuaded him to insist on an inquest into the prince's parentage. William, for his part, did not much care about the throne or the succession of England. This was really not foremost in his mind. What he cared about was the Netherlands and his continuing struggle with France. 
And for that purpose, William wanted English troops, English ships, and especially English money in order to keep up that fight against the French kingdom. And so for this reason, he was persuaded to demand an investigation, maybe because he genuinely hoped that that might get him and his wife back into the English line of succession, or maybe just because it was an opportunity that he saw to possibly overthrow James entirely. Now, James refused this demand, naturally. What would such an inquest even be? Right? There was no evidence for this cockamamie theory. So he had to say, no, there's nothing to investigate here. This is the prince. So William of Orange agreed to prepare for an invasion, and he gathered together a fleet of 260 ships and 15,000 men, which constituted about half of the army of the Dutch Republic. But he did not launch and cross the channel all through the summer of 1688, through July and August. And by the end of August, most observers assumed that his chance had passed, right? Just like, again, just like in 1066, when William of Normandy didn't have favorable winds all through the summer of that year, and Harold assumed that the window of opportunity was gone, he was safe, he sent his army away, but then, nonetheless, out of nowhere, William launched an invasion anyway in the bad season, in the fall, when it tends to be stormy and the weather makes it almost impossible to cross the channel. So this is what happened again in 1688. At the end of the summer, the weather turned bad and James let his guard down. And also, so did Louis XIV. So Louis XIV had agreed to help defend England and defend James, his fellow Catholic monarch, in case of a Dutch attack. So Louis also let his guard down. He moved his troops away from the coast and down southward towards the German border. So Louis now at this point was fully distracted and concerned with his struggles against the Habsburgs in Germany. And the Habsburgs had just that year beaten back the Ottomans in the east and captured Belgrade in Serbia. And so Louis was now concerned and occupied with the shifting balance of power on the continent. So he also turns his attention away from Holland and England. It's now the bad season. It's highly dangerous to try to cross the channel in the fall. But nonetheless, William of Orange declared in October that he was coming over to England anyway. And he was doing so not to try to overthrow James, but simply to protect, quote, the liberties, laws, and customs of England, and in order to investigate the true parentage of the young prince. So he set sail from the Netherlands on November 1st, was very luckily carried westward by the so-called Protestant wind, which moved his fleet from the North Sea down into the English Channel and allowed him to land on the 5th of November at Torbay in the southwest of England. So when this happens, James then quickly convenes a large army at Salisbury in the West Country to prepare for an engagement with William. But before any actual fighting, he then, it seems, retreated to London in order to take shelter and hold the capital. And this action was seen as uncharacteristic, unusually cowardly. People said that he had lost his nerve. And regardless of whether it was a wise move militarily, it did not inspire confidence, and it allowed William of Orange to begin to gather Whig supporters from the country. And James, in response, brought over then Irish Catholic troops from Ireland. And James, it seems again, was relying on the notion that his Catholic subjects were the most trustworthy and his most sure allies. So he brings over Irish Catholic fighters and officers, and he begins to sack and replace many of his Protestant officers and commanders in his own army and replace them with Catholics. And both of these actions then led to fear and anger and resentment within his own officer corps. So over the course of a few weeks, many of his important army officers that had served him, including helping him to put down the Monmouth Rebellion, jumped ship over to William. And at the same time, some important towns, including York, were seized by insurrections of the Protestant gentry and middle class. Right? The, the Protestants were the majority and they were strongest in the towns. So a lot of towns just immediately fall to these pro-William insurrectionaries. 
A personal blow then came on November 18th when Princess Anne, the king's own younger daughter, wrote an open letter of support approving of William's actions and approving of his demand for an investigation. So maybe she is thinking about her own place in the line of succession. Maybe she is thinking about her Protestant loyalties. But for whatever reason, it seems now the whole royal family is also rallying to William. So James, later in November, sends his family, his immediate family, abroad for their safety. And at this time, he's reportedly indecisive and suffering from severe nosebleeds, probably from hypertension, from great fear and anxiety over the situation. On December 11th, James himself finally tried to flee abroad. And on his way out of London, he threw the great seal of state into the Thames, trying to prevent William from being able to take up rulership if he took the city. But on his way out, trying to get to France, some fishermen recognized him and arrested him, took him back in custody to London, where a committee of supporters of William had already seized control of the city. So he is held there prisoner by this Williamite Revolutionary Committee. And on December 20th, the committee then passively released him and allowed him to flee abroad again, basically because he was just a political liability. They didn't see him as so much of a threat, and they didn't want to force then the new government to have to execute him as some sort of traitor. So they just let him go, and he fled abroad to France. On Christmas Eve, the committee in London formally asked William and Mary to come into the city and take up government. James's remaining forces quickly collapsed and dissolved into the country. So then there was a period of crisis, you could say a sort of interregnum, where James was still alive, but he was abroad. William and Mary were now both in the country, but what were they going to do? What was their status? And were they actually going to carry through with this sort of bogus investigation into the birth of the young prince? So there's a period of uncertainty until on February 6th, the English Parliament convenes at Westminster, and they declare that James had abdicated by virtue of fleeing the country, that that act in effect was a forfeiture of the throne. They then offered the crown jointly to William and Mary, right? Mary was technically the direct successor if you exclude James's young infant son. Mary was the successor, so she, you know, should have been monarch. But, there, you know, everyone knew that William was the one who had really achieved this whole feat. Uh, he had taken this great gamble of invading the country. He was married to Mary. He was a nephew. So they kind of threw him in and offered the crown jointly to William and Mary to be co-rulers. And they, they made this offer, though, on a condition, on the condition that they accept a so-called Bill of Right, which would limit royal powers and hopefully would prevent any more constitutional crises like had just happened with James. On the 11th of February, William and Mary accept, and they are proclaimed jointly king and queen of England and on the 13th, the Speaker of the House of Commons reads out the Bill of Right, declaring certain rights and prerogatives of Parliament and of Protestant subjects. Now, the situation is more complicated in Scotland. There are some more supporters of, of James in Scotland, so it takes a little longer. I won't get into Scotland here. I'm focusing on England for this lecture. But on April 4th, so about two months later, the Scottish Parliament also convenes, declares James to be ousted from the throne, and one week later on April 11th, proclaims William and Mary as king and queen, and they are jointly crowned then on May 11th. So power seems to have passed now effectively to William and Mary in England and Scotland. But now what about the colonies? The colonies also are significant parts of the picture by this point. So most of the colonial governments in North America and the Caribbean quickly proclaimed William and Mary. They, were, they tended to be strongly Protestant, and over the course of 1689, as official announcements of this change made their way to the colonies, the colonial governors and councils proclaimed William and Mary as the new rulers. But there were two exceptions to this. One was Maryland, which was a traditionally Catholic colony, run by the Calvert family of proprietors who were English Catholics. 
And in Maryland, the governor and the council kept quiet and just refused to formally acknowledge that anything had happened. And so they were then overthrown by an insurrection led by Protestant planters who, who overthrew the proprietary government and created a new regime that disenfranchised Catholics. So Catholics now became politically excluded in Maryland as they were in England. The other colony where the government refused to acknowledge William and Mary's claim to the throne was naturally the Dominion of New England, this new entity that had been created by James, which was very large and expansive and had different offices and councils, some in Boston and some in New York. So that government also remained silent and tried to remain in power. But they were then overthrown in Boston by an insurrectionary militia that was led by a so-called Committee of Public Safety, reminiscent of what would later happen in the French Revolution, right? And then in New York, it was overthrown by a rebel band led by a German Protestant colonist named Jacob Leisler, who took it upon himself to, to act on behalf of this Protestant, this new Protestant government, and who basically made himself a little revolutionary dictator in New York. So Leisler and the Committee of Public Safety held power for several months until William and Mary were able to send new governors to replace them. Leisler at first refused to acknowledge and hand over power to this royally appointed governor, and so he was taken prisoner and hanged. So all in all, by the summer of 1690, William of Orange's victory appeared to be complete in England, in Scotland, and in the colonies abroad. But meanwhile, what was going on in Ireland? Ireland was also a kingdom belonging to James. Ireland was predominantly Catholic. It was politically favorable to James. And so it formed a natural base of resistance and a possible base for James's counterstrike against the new Williamite regime. So the Irish counteroffensive began in March 1689, just a few months before William and Mary had even really been proclaimed and crowned in Scotland, James gathered together supporters, including French troops and mercenaries, and landed in Ireland in March 1689. The Irish Parliament supported him, condemned the revolution, and furthermore enacted an act of religious toleration. So following James's preferred policy of abolishing all the restrictions and penal laws against Catholics. In July 1690, William then landed in Ireland with a large English force and was able to confront and defeat James at the Battle of the Boyne. James then again fled abroad to France, and this was seen in Ireland as a cowardly act, and he came to be called in Irish Seamus Anchaka, or James the Shit. And as a result of this, many of James's strong supporters in Ireland, Scotland, and England basically gave up on James II, saw him as more or less a lost cause, but still did want, for religious and political reasons, wanted to see a restoration of the Catholic Stuarts and of the views and ideals that they represented in their eyes. And they focused their hopes then on the young prince, right, also called James, whom they saw as James III. And these supporters of James came to be called Jacobites, right, after James, the, the Latin form of James, Jacobus. So the Jacobite movement went into abeyance for a time after James's defeat at the Battle of the Boyne in Ireland, but it would come back in later years, focusing uh, and rallying around the prince, James, who then later came to be called James III. Okay, so... You have this divergence, right, where certain parties and factions in the British Isles turn their hopes and their loyalties towards the exiled Catholic Stuarts. But meanwhile, what about the larger mainstream Protestant majority and the now ascendant Whig party that now effectively held power? Well, they came up with a new political settlement. So as we saw, William and Mary took up rulership jointly, although really effectively the ruler actually was William. Mary herself was relatively withdrawn, not as interested in politics, and William was more active, more ambitious, and in addition to that he was simply taken more seriously as a man. So he was really the effective ruler. But the rationale for his accession to the throne was so flimsy, it depended on 
various, very tenuous claims piled one on top of another. The, uh, it depended on the idea that the young prince was illegitimate, for which there was no real evidence. It depended on the idea that James had abdicated from his throne by retreating to France. And furthermore, it depended on the idea that Parliament, in its authority, could somehow bestow joint title of rulership onto two rulers. And all of these things were really unprecedented. And hence, the subtext here was really clear, that really, in effect, Parliament had actually chosen the rulers that it preferred. And hence, this showed that when push came to shove, Parliament was really supreme. And while this new king, William of Orange, who now became King William III, although this king might set policy in various realms, especially military and foreign policy, nonetheless, ultimately, if he overstepped certain bounds, he could be replaced. And this new state of affairs in which parliament was actually effectively supreme was spelled out in a series of new laws. For one thing, there was the Coronation Oath Act, which added to and revised the oaths that monarchs had to take upon taking up the throne. They had to pledge to honor and uphold laws enacted by parliament. So it basically ruled out this whole idea of suspending power that the king could just uh, toss aside acts of parliament. And also it required the monarch to pledge to protect, quote, the true profession of the gospel and the Protestant reformed religion established by law. So there was no way, regardless of the personal views or convictions of the monarch, they could not re-Catholicize the country. And it was further elaborated then in the so-called Bill of Right, which I mentioned before. And the Bill of Right contained various limits on the royal power. It declared that the king could not suspend laws, could not levy taxes without the consent of parliament, could not keep a standing army in the country without the consent of parliament, and could not impose excessive bails, fines, or cruel and un unusual punishment. So it's very easy, of course, to look back retrospectively and see how all sorts of provisions of the Bill of Rights seem to prefigure the American Bill of Rights and sort of modern liberal democracy. But historically, it's important to look at this prospectively, to look at how these things came about as responses to what had happened before, right? As ways of trying to prevent the things that James II had done. And furthermore, also his father, Charles I, who had done things like levy taxes, levy a ship tax without the consent of parliament, raise a standing army, and even this provision against excessive bails, fines, or cruel and unusual punishment, right? It sounds almost like a perfect uh, forerunner of the American Bill of Rights, but really it was a response to George Jeffries and his draconian, you know, bloody assizes in the aftermath of the Monmouth Rebellion. The Bill of Rights also set, set out certain rights and prerogatives of Protestant subjects, right? It, it doesn't really say anything about <laughs> what if you're not a Protestant, you're still apparently suspect. But Protestant subjects have the right to petition the crown for redress of grievances. They have the right to bear arms and to join the militia. And they have the right to elect members of parliament freely without interference. And again, all of these things are direct responses to what had happened with James, right? The imprisoning of the seven bishops for petitioning against the king's acts, the firing and sacking of army and militia officers, which, again, the Bill of Rights allows the king to do that, just not to Protestants, and the ability to elect parliament without interference. And furthermore, as for parliament as an institution, the Bill of Rights requires that parliament must meet frequently. It doesn't say exactly how frequently, but presumably at least every few years, and that members of parliament have the right to speak freely in debates without punishment which is still a very important provision of the British Constitution today. It's called parliamentary privilege. An MP in a meeting of parliament can say whatever they want about whoever they want without being penalized. So with this changeover in power, as I said, the real power of parliament is now understood to be supreme. And informally, Parliament, it's understood, will be managed through voluntary alliances and self-organization 
among MPs, which will be managed through a two-party system, right? And the Whig and Tory parties, which had formed during the Popish plot and the exclusion crisis, they remain permanently. They become long-lasting fixtures of British politics. It's understood that power in government will be passed back and forth between these two parties. And one of them, incidentally, the Tory party, is still exists and is in power today. So the Whigs and the Tories have contending views of English society, and the Whigs, at least at this moment in time, now have the upper hand. They are really the actual power behind the throne now in English government. The Whigs are adamant about preventing any Catholic succession to the throne, whereas the Tories, by contrast, could sometimes entertain the idea of a possible Catholic restoration. This is one of the things that distinguishes Tories from Whigs. They can countenance the idea that maybe the Catholic Stuarts could come back to the throne, but only on the clear condition that the Protestant Church of England be protected. They are fully committed to a Protestant national church. So this, roughly speaking, is the settlement that comes out of this overthrow of power. And this revolution has a heavily disputed meaning and legacy. The traditional mainstream British Whig understanding is that this was a great advance and a great victory for liberty. It's traditionally called the Glorious Revolution by sympathizers because it succeeded in overthrowing the tyrant without shedding blood or with very little violence. So it was a bloodless revolution ensuring English rights and liberties as against tyranny. But on the other hand, there also have been more critical historians who take a much more cynical view of the sort of Whig ruling circles that orchestrated this revolution and of the sort of commercial individualist imperial society that they were trying to build. So many other historians don't call this a revolution at all. They see it more as simply a a seizure of power by a new rising wealthy elite based in the cities, which was advancing its own selfish interests. And for example, the Marxist historian Peter Leinbau refers to the event as, quote, the Williamite coup d'etat, which I really enjoy because you see it sprinkled through his books like The London Hanged. He just calls it that and doesn't even bother explaining that he's referring to the Glorious Revolution, as it's traditionally been called. He just calls it the Williamite coup d'etat. And there are others who have even gone further and called it, quote, the oligarchical revolution of property. Right? And you can see that in some ways as the core legal and social issue underlying this whole constitutional crisis was the particular rights and powers over private property, who and, and even at this point still specifically land, right? Who has the control over land? What can they do with it? But whether you see these events positively or negatively, the Whig understanding of England as a commonwealth of free men who have certain private rights and prerogatives, including the right to hold and control private property as represented through parliament and the acts of parliament, this understanding of English society became canonical, right? And again, although the Tory party persists and alternate understandings or ways of imagining England do not disappear, they are decidedly sidelined. Right? The Whig view of England is now ascendant. And as I mentioned before, this shift in power and this shift in thinking really paves the way for the modern commercial and imperial Britain that we know today. So hopefully I will get to that and how that led to the new Britain and the British Empire in later years. I'll get to that at another time. And furthermore, the the modern history and significance of this same monarchy and this line, this very complicated, convoluted dynastic line down to today, I hope to discuss soon with a historian of modern Britain, which hopefully we will be able to record and post in November. So if you want to hear all of my materials, including patron-only materials, again, please go to the link to my Patreon page, which should be in the description. Thank you.